I've, uh, I've gone to the age I had to go back into my bag and get my reading glasses. Uh, so there's something I want to read to you later. But I wanted to start with this slide because it's interesting that this slide came out, or this quote came out in June of 1996 uh, by Attorney General Janet Reno when the uh, NIJ published the convicted by juries exonerated by science that you heard about yesterday. Our system of criminal justice is best described as a search for truth. We had some discussion about that yesterday. Increasingly, the forensic use of DNA technology is an important ally in that search. By highlighting the importance and utility of DNA evidence, this report challenges the scientific and justice community. Among the tasks ahead are the following, maintaining the highest standards for collection and preservation of DNA evidence, ensuring DNA testing methodology meets rigorous scientific criteria for reliability and accuracy. We've made some progress on uh, those goals, but I would say if we knew back 12 years ago the progress we would have made in 12 years, I don't think we, we would be very happy about it. And I hope the progress we make in the next 12 years will, uh, will be a little more progressive. Um, so who, who am I? And why am I here? I am the executive director of the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence. We are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have seven participating law school innocence projects in North Carolina, and the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence coordinates all seven projects. So we have 200 volunteers that we are coordinating casework for. We get 1,200 claims a year, and those are just North Carolina claims. We get a lot of claims from other states that we do not take. Uh, we run about a 90% rejection rate after initial review. That means that we don't investigate, start an investigation or what we call a further review uh, on 90% of the cases that we get. We have 130 active cases. That means they're, they're in any stage from initial beginning further review to investigation. And we have criteria for what cases we take. And I wanted to show you this because there was some discussion yesterday about the volume of cases and uh, the number of cases that would be subjected to DNA testing um, and the floodgates opening and uh, innocence projects take a lot of pride uh, in, in maintaining their credibility um, and we are very selective on the cases that we bring forward. In North Carolina with 100 counties, um, there are no more than five to 10 cases a year that I would even approach a prosecutor or law enforcement about and that doesn't mean all five or 10 of those would need DNA testing. So we're very selective, and if we're reviewing that many cases and we're only bringing a handful forward, then we would expect that the ones that we bring forward would cause some pause and uh, would get some review and some cooperation. I went to a second meeting after our large meeting um, ended yesterday, and um, the question was posed, is there anybody in this room who's a defense attorney? And I, you know, I, I actually think of myself um, at the crossroads between prosecutors and defense attorneys. Sometimes I think of myself more as a prosecutor, although I'm sure there's not a prosecutor in North Carolina that would agree with that statement. Um, I, in our work, in innocence work, we are interested uh, in freeing the innocent uh, if someone is guilty, I want them to stay exactly where they are. Uh, and that's why we're very selective about the cases. So yes, it is defense work, but it is not your typical defense work. It is not trial work, and it is not typical post-conviction work. And so when we're talking about the adversarial system, I think it's important to recognize the adversarial system really does not apply to this work um, because it, it does not fit into the mold of uh, the justice system we've been working with for so long. North Carolina's had a history of uh, some incredible DNA cases. Uh, we have some incredible non-DNA cases too, but I know that we're focusing on the DNA cases today. Um, but that's another uh, question that gets raised is that with the volume of cases you're talking about, and we're, we're only looking at 227 DNA exonerations so far, then uh, justice system's doing pretty well. We're only talking about DNA cases. We're only talking about evidence that was one, collected, two, was preserved, three, can still be tested. 
uh, for where there is some cooperation or acceptance by the court for testing. Um, DNA is only in 5 to 10 percent of cases, but the things that cause wrongful convictions in DNA cases occur in non-DNA cases as, as well. But I'll stick to the DNA cases, because we, we have some great stories out of North Carolina. You heard the first one yesterday. Ronald Cotton was our first DNA exoneration case in North Carolina. You heard from Jennifer, and you heard from Ronald, and you know their incredible story. Uh, and uh, there is a frontline production called um, What Jennifer Saw, if you'd like to hear more about that story. Uh, that was when she referred to they were doing a documentary that's uh, out there. And they're also coming out with a book, I'll do some free press for them, uh, called Picking Cotton. Uh, that'll be coming out in a couple months, I think. The second case, Keith Brown, is a fascinating case. Didn't, didn't get one lick of print in North Carolina, not one line. Um, it was a um, two, two people, uh, rape and, and brutal beatings. Um, Keith took a plea uh, for 35 years. He was identified. And there's a 17-page confession. It might be 16. I don't want to exaggerate. 16-page uh, confession with his initials on the bottom of every page, with some times corrected and some other corrections on each page where he initials the changes. Um, pretty, pretty solid evidence. Um, and there was a serial uh, rapist, or what they suspect, suspected to be a serial rapist in Florida. And they knew that the man who they were looking at had spent some time in North Carolina, and they asked for rape kits for unidentified rape victims or unidentified rape suspects to be sent down to Florida to be tested. And the rape kit from Keith Brown case was sent by accident. And there was a hit on the serial rapist who was in Florida. So the only problem with that 16-page confession was Keith didn't know any of those facts. He was mentally challenged. He was very susceptible to suggestion. And those facts had to come from somewhere, but they did not come from Keith being at the scene of the crime. Leslie Jean, uh, another incredible story. And you'll notice from Leslie and Leo Waters um, summaries here, they're both from Onslow County. You'll also notice that they both had hypnosis. Um, the memories of the witnesses or victims involved were not quite as detailed as was needed. So they used hypnosis to bolster those memories. Um, Leslie's case was overturned uh, by the Fourth Circuit, but because the witness testimony could no longer be used, he was not retried. He had been a soldier at Camp, Camp Lejeune. He was uh, dishonorably discharged. When he was released from prison, they would not give him his military ID or his dog tags. Um, he was depressed. He could not find a job. He fought for 10 years to find the evidence in his case to prove his innocence because he was walking the streets uh, as a rapist. And uh, his evidence was found and tested, and he was exonerated in 2001, and the true perpetrator was identified. Um, because of Leslie's depression, he became an alcoholic. He, after his exoneration, he fell down some stairs and he is paraplegic. Uh, Leo Waters is quite a character. Uh, Leo uh, was also convicted of a, a rape. Uh, you, a, uh, someone who came to look at a, a waterbed for sale um, raped the woman who was uh, selling the bed. And um, Leo is our longest serving exoneree with 21 years. He now lives uh, out in a log cabin in the woods and does not want to be bothered by anybody. Daryl Hunt, you saw some clips from Daryl's case yesterday. The Trials of Daryl Hunt is an HBO documentary that is an incredible story, and I also recommend that you watch that. Um, he is our uh, second longest serving, 19 years. and. Uh, Again, I, I won't go into the details of Daryl's case. You saw some of those clips yesterday, but uh, another incredible story. And then Dwayne Dale, who's my um, personal favorite. Um, uh, I was his attorney in his exoneration case, and uh, 
my husband now refers to him as our fourth child. Um, the title of uh, the session yesterday when Ronald and Jennifer spoke and the title of this session today um, is Triumphs and Tragedies. And had you asked me uh, six months, six weeks ago what I would refer to Dwayne's case as, I would have said it's a triumph. Uh, he was basking in the glory of freedom. He was uh, so happy to be with his family. And we have spoken to numerous groups, and uh, I think uh, people who have come away from hearing him, his powerful talk would also agree it was a story of triumph. In the last month or two, it has turned into a story of tragedy. Uh, he is not going to be here with us today. And I'm very disappointed for you and for me uh, that he's not going to be able to make it. Uh, he lost 19 years of his life in prison, and he gained 19 years of nightmares, uh, 19 years of brutality, 19 years of numerous rapes, um, 19 years of trying to understand why this happened to him. And after a year and a half of being out, the nightmares have caught up with him, and the bitterness has caught up with him, and he is trying to find his way. Um, I can stand up here and tell you the facts of his case, and I will, um, but I've struggled with how I get you to feel Dwayne, uh, because it is these cases that bring to you the real people, the real lives, that are impacted uh, by DNA. Uh, the victims like Jennifer Thompson and the victims like Ronald Cotton and Dwayne Dale and the other 225 DNA exonerations um, and their families, their sons and their daughters and their sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers and friends and extended family who have supported these people and believed in them and suffered along with them for all the years that they are incarcerated and then continue to suffer along with them after they are released. Um, Dwayne became a different person after 19 years in prison and he became a person he does not want to be. And he does not know how to become something else. Um, I will read you a few things that Dwayne has written uh, after I tell you some more facts of his story. And uh, yesterday, Jennifer also returned, talked about a journey, her journey, and how her journey began with that night of hell when she was raped. Um, and she is on an incredible journey. And I I'm, I'm hope Dwayne will end up, uh, after some years, in a positive journey as well. Um, before I take you on his journey, though, I'd like you to do something for me, and that is to close your eyes and think back to when you were 19 years old. Um, and I, I know there's older people in the room We'll have trouble doing that, but think back to when you were 19 and think about the dreams and plans you had for your future. Think about what you accomplished in the 19 years after that. Maybe you got an education, uh, maybe two degrees. Uh, you got married. You had family. You bought your first home. You bought furniture. You went on vacations. You had holidays. You created memories. You created friends. Now take all that and wipe it out, because that is what happened to Dwayne. He had plans. He had aspirations. He was a, a good kid, um, and he lost everything. On September 4th, 1987, at 2.30 in the morning, a 12-year-old girl was sleeping in her bed in her apartment. She heard something at the window, and she saw someone cutting the screen out of her window, and someone climbed through the window. She was shocked uh, She what she was seeing. She moved a little too slowly towards the door that was slightly open with a little bit of light coming in from the hallway. The man moved quicker across the room and held the knife to her throat and told her to go back to the bed and shut the door. He was with her for about a half hour. He stole her innocence, and then he left. She lied in the bed for a while, petrified, 
afraid to move. Eventually, she went and found her mother and told her what had happened. Of course, her mother was uh, uh, the mother of three children. I can't imagine uh, what the mother was going through. Um, she, the victim described the man as uh, medium height, shoulder length, uh, sandy brown hair, uh, Caucasian, um, no shirt, shorts, uh, in his 20s, uh, and a light um, beard uh, that felt like maybe he hadn't shaved for several days. And the mother was absolutely focused on finding the man who had done this to her daughter. Three weeks after the rape, the mother saw a van drive by their apartment uh, with someone in the van who appeared to be looking up at the apartment window. That was Dwayne. Uh, he had friends who hung out at that apartment complex and he was driving by in his sister's van to see if he could find anybody. But he was driving by slowly and the mother found this very suspicious and she took the license plate number down and called the police. And the police said, uh, that's very interesting and thank you for letting us know, but you did not witness uh, the rapist, so we'll keep this information and we'll keep looking. Three weeks after that, so six weeks after the rape, uh, the mother was walking through the parking lot and saw Dwayne in a crowd of kids. She went inside and got her daughter and walked towards the crowd with the daughter and the daughter seemed nervous. And the mother said, is that him? And the daughter shook her head, yes. And that Dwayne became the rapist. Um, police came the next day to see Dwayne. He was, he was not at home. They left a card. Um, he went down to the police station. And they asked him where he was at 2.30 in the morning on September 4th. He didn't remember. It was six weeks earlier. He said he thought he was probably sleeping. Um, Yes, a lot of times if you don't do anything wrong, you don't know where you were. Um, he uh, went home and really didn't think anything else of it until October 20th, um, so about a few, a few days, four or five days after the, he, they presented him with a non-testimonial ID order. He gave all the samples willingly. He knew he was innocent. He didn't object. Um, and again, he didn't hear anything for a long time, not until May of the next year, when he was reading the paper and he read that he had been indicted for first degree burglary, first degree sex offense, first degree rape, indecent liberties with a minor, and lewd and lascivious acts. He went down to the paper, I mean to the police station, uh, went to the sheriff's department first, nobody knew who he was, went to the police station. Um, he remembers very specifically, it was Friday the 13th. And uh, he was arrested. He spent four and a half days in prison and he, in jail and he thought that was the worst thing he was ever going to go through uh, because he knew he was innocent. Before trial, he was offered a plea bargain. He was offered three years probation if he would plead guilty to a misdemeanor. He refused to take that plea and that's a decision I'm sure he questioned many times over the years that followed. But he refused to t take a plea, he said, because he knew not only did he not do anything wrong, but that someone had hurt that girl. Someone had raped that girl, and if he took a plea, she would never get justice. He was checked, uh, he went to trial in March of uh, 1989 Trial was Monday, a Monday and a Tuesday. On Wednesday, he was found guilty. On Thursday, he was sentenced to two life sentences plus 18 years. And he was taken to central prison. He was 20 years old. He was shackled in his hands and in his, on his ankles and around his waist. He was put into a holding room with other inmates. And uh, they started telling him how lucky he was he wasn't going to Polk Youth Institute because that was a terrible place and at least they had brought him to Central. Then the guards came in, asked him how old he was, he said he was 20, and they said, we have gotta transfer you to Polk. When he got to Polk, he was crying, he was shaking, he was scared, and they put him into protective custody, which was probably uh, the thing that saved him 
um, for the next about a year and a half, he stayed in protective custody. He was in um, a cell alone 23 hours and 45 minutes a day. And uh, eventually he decided that he needed to, um, he was going to go crazy with himself and he needed to go ahead and get out of protective custody. He was transferred to a new prison that uh, actually he says was much better than the youth prisons because uh, things were calmer, the youth prisons were terrible. Um, and he became very comfortable, uh, let his guard down a little bit, met some people, um, was trying to deal with what was happening to him, and he became too trusting, and he was raped by two men. Um, and that wasn't the last time that that happened to him. Uh, he's a small, uh, good-looking guy who went in as a child rapist, a child rapist of a 12-year-old of a girl, a 12-year-old black girl, and he was a white man. And when they checked him into prison, they took his card that had spelled out what he was convicted of, and they passed it around to all the inmates so that everybody knew what he was there for. And he suffered the consequences of that for the next 19 years. Dwayne knew the power of DNA. He read the papers. And in 1989, he read uh, about the case of David Vasquez in Virginia. And he wrote his attorney, and he said, I want you to find the evidence in my case, and I want you to preserve it. I want you to, to make sure they don't destroy it, and I want you to test it. And she said, told him that he needed to wait until his appeal was final before he could have DNA testing. In 1992, his appeals were final. Everything had been denied. And he wrote her again and said, please find my evidence. Please get it tested. She wrote back and said she was in the middle of a very busy, uh, very uh, hard case. It was going to be several weeks. But after that, she would get on finding the evidence and getting it tested. He wrote her several times after that. In 1995, his family learned that the evidence in his case had been destroyed. Uh, it was destroyed in 1994. The attorney did not get around to looking for the evidence for three years after he made that request. Uh, with the destruction of the evidence, it went the destruction of his hopes. Um, he knew the power of DNA. He knew what it meant to his life. Um, and they hoped, his family hoped and prayed for something. Um, it, along the way, you'll see in the picture on the far side here, he's uh, hugging a young boy. Um, that boy was born seven months after Dwayne went into prison. That's Dwayne's son. Uh, his girlfriend was a couple months pregnant when he was convicted. So he spent years uh, of despair thinking his evidence had been destroyed, having his son grow with uh, a few visits over time, um, not knowing who his father was and visiting his father uh, at a prison. Duane, over the years, Duane wrote letters to everybody, from governors to senators to the president to the president's wife to Oprah Winfrey. Uh, there is no one who didn't get a letter from Duane, uh, and many got one every day. Uh, the Center on Actual Innocence got its letter, uh, its first letter in 2000. Duane sent his completed questionnaire in in 2001. And the, the case had all the signs that um, trigger us to have specific interest in a case. The misidentification had all the, the red flags uh, uh, of a misidentification. Of course, it was just an ID then, but a young victim woken in the middle of the night, limited time, a limited exposure, limited light, uh, weapon focus, trauma, uh, cross race, uh, had all the factors that can lead to a misidentification. The plea, of course, is very interesting for someone to be offered three years probation. Uh, if they've uh, committed a rape against a 12-year-old girl and they're offered three years probation, that's a really attractive plea. Uh, and the only forensic evidence presented at trial was microscopic hair comparison of one hair. The throw rug in front of the girl's bed had been vacuumed and the debris collected. 
there were 40 Negroid hairs, three Caucasian, two pubic hairs that did not match Duane, and one head hair they determined was microscopically consistent. So it was a, a very attractive case for us. Uh, the victim at that point was an adult. We do not contact victims uh, very, very rarely. Uh, and when we contact them, we contact them very, very carefully. Uh, we have a letter that goes out that I've had reviewed from several, several district attorneys to make sure that it's worded appropriately. I've shown it to victim advocates. Um, I do have cases where victims have responded to my letters and said, it never happened. I made it up. My mother was being beaten. Uh, my parents were going through a divorce and I was afraid my father was going to get custody. It does happen. But in this case, we did try to contact the victim and uh, she did not want to talk to us. And if they say they don't want to talk, that's it, we're done. We, I think over the years, tried 12 different times uh, to, in the hope that the letter from this, the county saying everything had been destroyed was not accurate. We made phone calls, we'd made visits um, to try and find evidence in Duane's case. And over and over again, we were told uh, county only keeps evidence in murder cases. Everything from rape cases is destroyed. Uh, in 2004, we had to make the, di the difficult decision to tell Duane we were closing his case. There were no avenues for us to pursue, and we closed it with him so he could move on, but we never closed it in our office because we believed in his innocence. And I do not say that very often in these cases. With the 1,200 letters we get a year, most of them are guilty. Um, in July of 2007, uh, we were cleaning out our old files. Uh, we, with all the rejected cases, we run out of room. And uh, we used to shred them, and then about five years ago, we decided we would just box them up, and now uh, my attic looks a little like that warehouse picture you saw yesterday. Um, but before we box them up, we, put, we go through them by name and we make sure that there's not specific cases we want, we want to go ahead and leave in the office. And Duane's was one we all knew, and we said, that's not going in the attic, that stays in the office. And we said, let's just make one more phone call, uh, just for grins. In July 2007, we made a phone call, talked to the evidence room manager, and he said, no, we only keep evidence in murder cases, no rape cases back that far, there's no way there's anything here. Same answer we always got. And then right before he was gonna hang up the phone, he said, unless, unless it was one of these officers, because we just were doing an inventory and we found that they were putting evidence in the wrong place. And Duane's case was handled by one of those officers. And the rape uh, evidence had been put on shelves with murder evidence. And thank God uh, they put it in the wrong place because they had they put it in the right place, it would have been destroyed. And had they done an inventory in 18 years, it would have been destroyed. So there's a silver lining for incompetence. From that point on, uh, this, this case is absolutely a miracle case. Um, Brandy Vickery, who is the district attorney in Wayne County, North Carolina, uh, is my hero. Um, he, uh, epitomizes cooperation, and um, he is a tough prosecutor, but he's fair. And this case, I think, set records uh, in how quickly Duane was released from prison. We found the evidence in mid-July 2007. Duane was released from prison August 28, 2007, six weeks after we found the evidence. Um, the SBI lab uh, worked with us. Uh, and allowed us to bring in our own expert so that we could talk together about how 20-year-old evidence should be handled, what type of testing should be done. Um, the bags were sealed, so we didn't know exactly what it was in there. We hoped the rape kit was in there. We, opened, we were able to witness them as they, as they opened the bags. Uh, it turns out all the evidence that was admitted at trial, which was the rape kit, was destroyed in 1994 when it went to the clerk's office. But what was left in the bag was the bed sheets and the child's nightgown. 
And we didn't know what type of evidence was going to be on that, that material. Um, and uh, we didn't know what, what testing would yield. Um, I knew <laughs> what testing would yield. And part of the, the reason I knew that is because when I went to prison to tell Dwayne we had found evidence, I said to him, you're going to be up for parole in a few years. If we test this and it matches you, it will hurt you. It will hurt your chances for parole. He had refused to go through um, the sexual uh, predator treatments. He had refused to, to express remorse. He had refused to acknowledge his guilt. Uh, and if the evidence matched him, it was going to hurt him. And I looked him in the eyes and I said, if there's any chance this is going to match you, don't do it. Don't have me do it. And he said, you take everything you can find and you test it against everything they can find. I'm innocent. And those are powerful words. Um, they did find uh, semen on the inside seam of the child's nightgown. Um, I was asked some interesting questions during the testing in that case. I was asked, how do you know th that she didn't have sex with somebody else? And I said she was 12 and she was a virgin. And they said, how do you know someone else didn't have sex in the bed? These questions are being asked to me by the scientist. The scientist who looks up the, at the evidence objectively, who is supposed to only be interested in the results, not the investigation. And at that point, I said, let the police and the DA do their job, and you do yours. And it was not only an exclusion of Duane, but it was a hit. And I love when there's a hit. And I know there's a lot of people out there who object to DNA being taken from, from everybody, but I say give it at birth. Um, so there was a hit, and there was a hit on someone who had been charged with other rapes, uh, who was on, in prison on 11 breaking and enterings. And there was a hit on August 27, 2007. We went to court on August 28, 2007. And the district attorney said, Dwayne Dale will only walk out one set of doors in this courtroom. And we will stay here until he walks out as a free man. He was, Dwayne was pretty happy for a long time. Um, even though he was, he was met with some hardships. Uh, a month after he got out, he was hit with a lawsuit for 18 years of back child support. Uh, the mother of the child had read that he might be receiving some compensation from the state, and uh, she felt she was entitled to that. The other hardship for Duane was hearing that the prosecutor had worried about this case over the years, hearing that while I was at a conference, the sheriff for the county came up to me and pulled me into a corner so no one else would hear and said, you need to look into this case. And of course, we were already looking into it, but he did not want anybody to know that he was mentioning this to me. To hear that defense attorneys had been concerned about his case. To hear that the victim had often wondered had she gotten the right person. To hear that the victim had said to law enforcement, I'm worried I get, didn't get the right person, and they said, you did great. You did it. That is what's painful to him. To know that there were questions out there that people were afraid to ask because they were the prosecutor, because they were the police. To hear that in 1992, when he asked for DNA testing, the evidence was sitting on his shelf. And two years later, the evidence that he, the rape kit was destroyed, but the other evidence sat on his shelf for 16 years. Um, those are the things that cause him pain. Those are the things that cause him to look for answers, and those are answers I can't give him. He's angry now beca because no one's responsible. No one's responsible for what happened to him. No one's responsible for the 18 years that he lost with his son. I tell him that his story inspires others, and that was enough for a while, uh, but it's not enough anymore. Last week, he was 
in my arms crying, saying, why did you get me out? Leave the others that are applying that you think are innocent, leave them there. And he called me a couple days later and said, I thought about what I said and I want to take it back. Don't get them out for them. Get them out for the, and I won't use the words, SOBs that did it. Get them out so you can prosecute the people who do these crimes and sit back while we're in prison rotting for what they did. He's also angry about the lack of respect for his pain. He's angry about the rubber stamp that was on his pardon. He wanted a signature. He wanted a phone call. He offered to help Department of Corrections. He said, maybe what I can do is I can give them some insights on what happens in prisons. And the response was, is this a publicity stunt? Are you criticizing our work? And that was the end of that offer. Jo yesterday, John Morgan asked Ronald and Jennifer how their families and friends felt about what happened. And I can tell you, Dwayne has five brothers and a sister, um, and they are all suffering. They suffered every day he was in prison, and they're all suffering with him now, and they're all at a loss what to do to help him. I did want to read a few things that have Dwayne's actual words. This letter was written uh, in 1989, right after he went to prison, about two months later. I'm really losing my mind here at Blanche. Being in a cell alone for 23 hours a day is wearing on my stability. I know that you are doing the best job that you can. This was written to his attorney. I really do appreciate that. Please understand I'm here with other guys that are telling me that the Court of Appeals will deny my appeal in a matter of minutes. I try not to listen, but it's always in the back of my mind. I may never get out of here. I can't handle Blanche anymore. I'm going to have to get out of protective custody and go to open compound. I don't know what to do. I can't fight. I can never try to really hurt someone. It just seems that eventually I'm going to have to hurt someone or I will be killed. I know I can't stand to be alone anymore. All of the time, I have become my own worst enemy. I need to speak to, to a psychiatrist, but there isn't one here. I need somebody to talk to now that will listen and understand. Nobody will. I can't talk to my family. All that does is upset them. They are going through hell, too. Meanwhile, I'm carrying the weight of the world on my back. I can't go insane. Then I, I'd never get back to court. The only place that will get me is into central prison in the violent side of the psycho ward. I'm finding it impossible to stay sane. It's so lonely and dark and small in here. I don't know what's going on out there. All I know is that I'm alone, I'm scared, and I've been left behind. I can't live like this. I never dreamed that my life would be like this. I'm living a constant hell. What is a person supposed to do? I'm stuck between sane and insane, live or, death or dead. Either way, it's a no-win situation. How much is a person expected to take? I can't believe that this has happened to me. This supposedly great, free, fair country of ours has done this to me. A few weeks later, if my appeal does not come through or I do not receive a new trial, can I request the death penalty? I would rather have that than what I have now. I have seriously thought about this. It's give me life, give me liberty, or give me death. I want North Carolina to be responsible for my death and not another inmate. This was written six months after he got out. I guess I'm starting to really get angry, and I'm misdirecting my anger. I'm starting to really see what has been done to me, just a taste of it, I'm afraid. I'm not doing good. I've been used to being by myself, or at least having that option to just be alone. Right now, I could use 30 days in the hole. That's sad, but I swear it's true. I'm losing it bad. I'm confused from top to bottom. I'm not at peace at all. I have no structure to my day. I have no idea how to put any into it. I have no idea what to expect in the next 15 minutes, much less the rest of my day. I'm used to having a lot of structure in my days. I got used to prison. The adjustments I made to myself so I could survive are unimaginable, but I did, and that is who I became. And now I have to adjust who Duane is again, and I don't know who that is. I need help. My family can't deal with that. 
and be expected to know how to deal with it. I'm not getting any better as time goes on. It's only getting worse. You told me that it would, but I had no idea. And this is from the day before yesterday. My shattered life and my shattered family take no consolation in the fact that I can now die free. I am a social cripple who is unable to bridge the 20 year gap. We had a meeting yesterday after the large meeting and there was this discussion about the scope of the problem. And we can talk about the numbers, we can talk about how many of the 227 makes up. Um, but the real bottom line is there are solutions. And if there are solutions, one person is too many. One person is too many to be in prison who's innocent. One guilty person out on the streets convicting more crimes while the guilty person is in prison is too many. And so I will join in debates about the numbers. But in the end, it doesn't matter if there are solutions that can be put into place. Thank you. One thing, I, 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 we get this question, and I want to show you a picture. That's the true perpetrator, and that's Dwayne now. Um, I don't have a picture of the perp when uh, the crime was committed, uh, but that's them now. Um, there's some resemblance. The, the, problem, the problems were at trial that uh, Dwayne was 19 years old and he couldn't even grow stubble. Uh, he didn't shave for weeks and weeks before trial to show that all he had was a very light shadow and some hairs growing out of a mole. Um, he had a Billy Idol haircut. Um, I know some of you are old enough in this room to know who Billy Idol is. Um, bleach blonde haircut. And the lab uh, analysis of the hair that was collected from him actually says bleached on the ends. Um, the, the, uh, I know we don't like to go back <laughs> and look because uh, it's kind of like pointing fingers, but <clears throat> there was a lot of tunnel vision in this case, not just by law enforcement. Uh, the person who committed the rape lived um, a few blocks from Duane, and he was known as the Peeping Tom. Uh, he had been arrested for peeping into the window of an NC State student, and a few weeks after this rape was ar arrested for raping an uh, NC State student. There was tunnel vision on the part of law enforcement. There was tunnel vision on the part of prosecution. And there was tunnel vision on the part of the defense attorney. Someone brought the name of the true perpetrator, William Neal, to the defense attorney um, right after Duane's conviction, and never, she never followed up. She had her own theory of the case that she presented at trial, which was completely based on tunnel vision. Um, so it is important to go back and look at these cases, not to point fingers, but to learn about what we do in each of the areas, law enforcement, prosecution, and defense. Because uh, I'm, I'm a believer that ineffective assistance of counsel is something that leads to a lot of these convictions. Anyway, that's my last thought. Thank you. Morning. I'm right on the edge, so be careful. Okay. But I wanted to speak really on uh, behalf of the crime lab community, and as president of ASCLAD, I just felt compelled uh, to say a few words. And it's only in relation to a couple of comments uh, that you made, and were in your slides that I'm bringing this up for the open group. So not directed to you, Christine, but to the general group. Um, and it's very difficult for me to discuss because I don't want to take away from the power of the presentation you just gave. But I'm struggling with the non-scientific community constantly addressing what I see the term always, which is unreliable science. And that's what I want to address. I would submit to you that it's the progress and advancements in science 
that are the very reasons why we are all in this room today. Absolutely. And when I see terms like unreliable science up on a board or on presentations, and we've seen it from a few speakers during this meeting, it troubles me in that regard, particularly because uh, during your presentation, um, clearly there were struggles with the prosecutor, the defense, even the victim. Uh, perhaps there are even signs of reservation about decisions that were made. Uh, you even spoke to the fact of tunnel vision. And what I'd like to suggest to the group as you move forward in working in collaboration with one another as different groups is we stop looking this as an issue of unreliable science, but perhaps an issue of unreliable justice. And the reason why I say that is that there are solutions, and I, I believe that many of those solutions are not looking to crime lab reforms. I think a lot of it has to do with reforms of what happens within the courtroom. Thank you. Well, I've, I've never been one to not comment. Um, the um, we, science is teaching us that what we thought was science, and it doesn't all come out of crime labs, uh, is not science. Um, in Ronald Cotton's case, there was a piece from the insole of his shoe that was matched to the, the in, insole from his shoe. And it was not until he was exonerated that there learned there was no match. Um, uh, Ray Crone's case, the bite mark analysis and the comparison, the match between his teeth and the bite mark, um, we are learning that what we called science is not the science that we thought it was. Um, that's, not a, that's not a comment on today's science. That's a comment on what we're, we're learning from these cases. And that's not uh, an accusation against everyone or anyone. It's the same as the uh, standards for counsel and who should be appointed and what kind of training they should have. Um, the person who was appointed to Duane's case should never have been trying that case. The defense bar is continuing to learn. The prosecution is continuing to learn. Law enforcement is continuing to learn. And so is the science. One, one more comment. Uh, your, your presentation was excellent, uh, but since I ran the meeting last night that you referred to, uh, I want to ensure the people here that from a law enforcement perspective, we are as concerned as you are about these mistakes. We want to do what's right, and the meeting last night was about resources. It's not about what's right or wrong. It's not about the numbers. It's about getting the job done. We sincerely believe in what Project Innocence is doing. We appreciate what's, what, what you've done, but we have to find a way to make it work within our restricted resources. It's not about science. It's not about defense attorneys. It's not about prosecutors. It's about doing the right thing. And law enforcement wants to do the right thing. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for uh, the presentation. I'm, uh, I'm a scientist, but I also uh, run the Idaho Innocence Project. And um, just as a, uh, you know, because of the comment from uh, Director of ASLAB, what, what I'd suggest, that, uh, what I've seen, the best way to question the science is when experts who are actually employed in crime labs in other states are allowed to come in on cases um, to be consultants. And I, I do private consulting, but I don't work in a crime lab. And I, I really think that's the best system, uh, because then you get a, an honest view from within the field, within the actual professional community that's doing the work. The unfortunate thing is a lot of states prevent their people from consulting. And in fact, that should be encouraged. As an academic, 20% of my time can be consulting. That's probably the most important thing that I do, because I go all over the country and see how things are done other places. Uh, we both, we get to criticize, I get crossed very heavily, so I have to be very careful about what I say. And uh, my friends in crime labs in other states who I can send cases to do excellent work. Um, and I recommend them every chance I get. But so many states will not allow their scientists to consult on cases even outside of the state. And I think that that, that leads to a very um, divided community within the science group. So I, I would just encourage states to pursue policies that allow some percentage of time to be uh, for consulting on cases outside of state. 